Good morning, everyone. We're live from the World Bank in Washington, D.C. to mark the 10th anniversary of the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility. And we're doing a series of live interviews about this global partnership that involves civil society, governments, uh, business, and also indigenous people. We're starting this series of interviews with Francis Seymour, Senior Fellow at the World Resources Institute, also the author of the book, Why Forests, Why Now? The Science, Economics, and Politics of Tropical Forests and climate change. I'm going to start, Francis, by asking you to give us an overview of these 10 years of this fund and also on each, which stage are we when we talk about forests? That's a great question. Um, the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility was born 10 years ago at the climate negotiations in Bali in 2007. And at that time, Red Plus for reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation was a brand new concept and was just being introduced into the climate negotiations for the first time. And it was still controversial. We were remembering that there were actually protesters uh, lying down on the sidewalk outside the venue when FCPF was launched um, because there was concern that maybe putting a value on forest carbon would lead to unintended negative consequences for local communities. But I think what's happened over the last 10 years is quite an evolution um, of the idea and a deepening of understanding of how it can be a positive force, not only for protecting forests, but also for advancing the rights of indigenous peoples. And I think uh, there's been a, a trust built among various stakeholder groups um, from government, from civil society, and increasingly um, from the private sector as well about common interests in this agenda and lessons learned about how to move it forward. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest issues that was focused here on this discussion was also how to find new sources of financing. What's your point on that? Well, um, the original premise of Red Plus was that uh, forest-rich developing countries would be rewarded for their efforts to conserve the forests with significant large-scale finance um, based on, on, on what they actually achieved. And at the time that Red Plus was first conceived, back in 2007, the idea was that there was going to be a global market in carbon and countries would be able to, to access you know, the funds from that market um, to be compensated for their, their, their conservation of forests. As we know, in the climate uh, conference in Copenhagen two years later, um, there was a failure to reach agreement and that market never materialized up to now. So my colleague and I who, who wrote this book, um, one of our main conclusions is that Red Plus, in a way, remains a great idea that's hardly been tried because there have only been a few countries that have had the certainty of reward um, for their, their performance. And I think what's interesting is how much progress and momentum has continued even despite the fact that there really hasn't been big money on the table. Now, what we heard in the panel just now was about some new innovative sources of finance that some of the private sector companies um, are beginning to understand that their ability to follow through on, for example, um, commitments to get deforestation out of their commodity supply chains um, maybe will uh, justify some investment on their part. We heard about new financial instruments like green bonds that countries might float. Um, we heard from the World Bank about the potential for um, countries to access other development finance for this agenda. So I think that there are, are some um, other alternatives um, being pursued, but the original premise of, of Red Plus, the performance-based finance, is, is still one that I think we should um, uh, continue to, to work for. And I think there are some um, carbon financing mechanisms um, being developed, including most recently the Green Climate Fund, which is the official funding mechanism under the Climate Convention, has opened a half billion dollar uh, window for results-based payments. And so making sure that that gets launched in a successful way will be very important. Might be also important to tell people watching that what's Red Plus, the program for reducing emissions on deforestation and forest degradation. So th from your point of view, do you believe that when you're talking about finance, then the solution is pretty much on private, on the private business? I don't think so. Um, at the end of the day, any private investment scheme depends on a, a policy environment that makes that you know, investment profitable. So um, only governments, for example, can set a regulatory framework and enforce the law. 
because, for example, if a private investor invests in protecting a forest and uh, there's no law enforcement to protect from a third party coming in to, you know, destroy that forest, then, you know, the investment proposition evaporates. So there's there's certainly a, um, an irreducible role of the state um, in, in making sure that this can work. The state also has a role to play in um, what's called in the, the red space the safeguards agenda. In other words, making sure that these efforts to protect the forests don't have unintended negative consequences for local communities or for vulnerable ecosystems. And so um, the state needs to be involved. We heard in the session just now um, stated a concern, a very real one, that um, even the you know indigenous peoples are demonstrated to be the best stewards of the forest. You know, wherever there are indigenous communities, usually the forests are in better shape. Um, but when they defend their forests, they often get killed. And that, you know, the fact that that continues means that we really need much more effective um, intervention from the state to protect environmental defenders and recognize the rights of local communities who are protecting the forest. Francis, we know that one of the leading causes of deforestation is agriculture. We also know that agriculture is a big solution to fight climate change. How can these two areas coexist in your point of view? Well, one of the most important things that's happened over the last five years is that companies involved in the supply chains of commodities such as soybeans, uh, palm oil, beef and fast-growing timber for the pulp and paper industry have come forward and made these commitments to get deforestation out of their supply chains. In other words, to stop purchasing um, those commodities if they come from recently deforested land. And that's really important because those sort of commercial scale agricultural drivers are the leading cause of deforestation in the tropics and, and have been for a number of years now. Um, many of these companies have made a promise to achieve this goal by 2020, and uh, that's coming up pretty soon. So there's a lot of activity um, on that front right now. And companies under pressure from advocacy groups, but increasingly, again, seeing this in their own self-interest to control both material as well as reputational risk, are becoming more transparent and disclosing where they are sourcing um, their, their commodities. And a revolution in forest monitoring technology, which basically allows us to see where deforestation is happening from space, you know, from satellite imagery, um, makes it uh, in the interest of these companies to really get on board with the program and to be part of the the solution rather than part of the problem. And while we have not turned the tide on deforestation yet, there have been a lot of intermediate milestones that show progress towards success in that, that agenda. We're also here to look at the future. Uh, and my question is, from your point of view, if you believe that right now should we be concerned or should we be hopeful about what's going to happen in the near future? Well, it's definitely both. Um, as was stated from the panel just now, there really is a sense of urgency. I mean, we, we may well be reaching tipping points. Um, there was an, an article published in a, a science journal just a, a couple of weeks ago um, reiterating the concern that if deforestation in the Amazon, for example, proceeds um, past a certain point, there could be a tipping point in actually changing those ecosystems from humid tropical forests to more savanna and the release of carbon that would accompany that shift would be catastrophic for reaching the, the goals of the Paris Agreement. Similarly, we see um, degradation of the world's oceans, and a lot of that is, you know, the carbon dioxide that's not, you know, maintained in the terrestrial ecosystems ends up going into the, the oceans or the atmosphere. That's causing acidification and another ecological catastrophe. So I think we need to be concerned because current trajectories are not going to keep us below that two-degree uh, limit, much less the one point degrees. So we need to, to have an all-hands-on-deck um, uh, strategy to, to uh, reduce emissions from all sources, but including the so-called natural climate solutions. Um, but there's also reason for hope. Um, my father uh, de dedicated his career to the civil rights movement. And, you know, when I was a child in North Carolina, the schools were still segregated. But in my lifetime, there's been dramatic, you know, improvement in the civil rights agenda. And I think that we can see a similar, you know, shift in environmental sensibilities. I mean, young people today, you know, they get it, you know, that climate change is an emergency and we need to do something. And so I think we'll start seeing, you know, dietary shifts where people move away from consuming, you know, high emissions, um, foods, and I think that we'll see a norm shift in the same way we've seen related to the corporate commitments, related to indigenous rights, um, related to being able to talk about corruption and illegality. You know, those norm shifts will shift behavior so that something that was okay even 10 years ago is not okay now, and that'll help us achieve the objectives and be where we need to be.
On a personal level, what's your climate ambition for the next 10 years? Well, uh, the international community has agreed on a number of goals. We have, you know, the New York Declaration on Forests related to forests. We have the Paris Agreement, which includes forests. Um, we have the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, I think that those are ambitious, but they may not be enough. And so my own goals is to not only uh, meet those objectives, but exceed them as soon as possible. Thank you so much, Francis. If you're watching online, don't forget to also follow this conversation using the hashtags C4C Zone and Better with Forests. Just keep tuned, we're coming with more interviews to talk about the future of forests. Thank you.